بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم لإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Okay, today we'll be covering verse 140, inshallah, and 141. Okay, just to recap on last week's verse, verse 139, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قُلْ say, أَتُحَاجُّونَنَا فِي اللَّهِ Are you debating or arguing with us regarding Allah? وَهُوَ رَبُّنَا Whilst he is our Lord, وَرَبُّكُمْ and your Lord, وَلَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا For us are our deeds, and for you are your deeds, وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُخْلِصُونَ And we, whilst we, are for him, مُخْلِصُونَ, sincere. And we said that in this verse, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned several things. And several issues which the Mufassirin uh, dealt with in their books. One of the first things that is mentioned is the argument or the issue of debate where we said that the Jews and the Christians were debating with the Muslims regarding Allah. Regarding Allah means regarding the religion of Allah because obviously they would not debate with regards to the existence of Allah. The Jews and the Christians both accept the existence of Allah and so the debate is not regarding whether Allah exists or not rather it's whether or not their religion is true and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he poses it and presents the question in this manner or the argument in this manner that are you debating are you gonna debate and argue with us about the religion of Allah and we said previously that the Jews had many issues with regards to the religion. And some of these things were very trivial. Okay, like, you know, we don't believe in Islam because the angel Jibreel brought Islam. If another prophet or if another message, <coughs> another angel brought, brought Islam, we would have believed it. But because Jibreel has brought down Islam, we don't accept it. And we have an enmity with Jibreel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted their trivial question. And some of the issues that they had were <clears throat> with regards to Ibrahim alayhi salam, with regards to Ismail, Ishaq, etc. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleared those as well. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, look, that if your argument is with regards to the religion of Allah, then Allah is our Lord and He is your Lord. Just as He is your Lord, He is our Lord. Just as he is our Lord, he is your Lord. Okay, you know, why are you making Allah exclusive to yourselves? Why are you making the religion of Allah exclusive to yourselves? Why are you saying that it's only you that can uh, be entered into paradise? It's only you that can gain guidance. Rather, it's up to Allah whom he wants to enter into paradise. And then Allah Ta'ala said, that the rewards, that the deeds themselves, the deeds that a person does, those deeds are, are exclusive to themselves. Meaning the deeds that you do, they are the deeds that you do. And the deeds that we do are the deeds that we do. Allah Ta'ala will question you about your deeds and will question us about our deeds. Okay, and finally Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala finishes it off with a last reminder. Okay, to finally decisively uh, clear the argument or to end the argument, which was that our deeds are all based upon one issue, which is sincerity to Allah. If we truly have sincerity to Allah, then our deeds will be accepted. And if we are debating and arguing for other reasons than sincerity, then in reality Allah will not accept our deeds. Okay, this was something, this is a summary of what we covered last, last week. Yeah, sister, did you have a question? 
Sorry? Okay, no problem. Okay, so that was last week's verse. Now, in this verse we did, we did last week, there were, we covered many of the issues. There was one issue which I, 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 I left, okay, which I asked you regarding your homework. Okay, did anyone do the homework? Yeah. Okay, so one, two, two people, two of the brothers, three of the brothers. Yeah, sisters, how many sisters did the homework? Okay, no problem. So brothers, yeah. Surah Hujrat ayah 13. Okay, Surah Hujrat ayah 13. Uh, if you can read the ayah, I'm not hafiz of the Quran. So don't be able to tell you of my <laughs> the noblest, the noblest among you is Allah's sight, is the one who best performs his duty. Allah's all in all way. Okay, in akramakum in the light atqakum. Okay, very good. In akramakum. And remember that the homework was with regards to the ikhlas. Sincerity in the Quran. How is the sincerity manifest in the Quran? You know, are there any examples which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions where sincerity is the core aspect of the verse? Okay, so the brother has mentioned one, in akramakum in the light atqakum. Okay, that the most noble and the most honored, you know, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who have taqwa. And although taqwa and sincerity are two separate topics they do come hand in hand in many times yeah surah al hajj verse 37 okay okay so lay yanan allah luhumuha walla dimauha walla kin yanan hu taqwa minkum okay the laham the meat the flesh the blood of an animal when it's slaughtered Okay, when a person does, does sacrifice, slaughters an animal for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more specifically in the days of Hajj and, uh, and pilgrimage, then the blood and the meat is just a representation of the taqwa of a person. Meaning that this will only be accepted in the eyes of Allah if a person has taqwa. If there's no taqwa, again, it will not be accepted. Okay, so there's also an element of ikhlas in there. That if your deeds are not backed with ikhlas, with sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is important to understand. Okay, like I said last week, it's important that we check our deeds. All right, you know, a person may, many, for many years, a person may be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many years. And the person may be doing it for other reasons, not sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very dangerous, because if a person comes in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment, and he's done all of this for other reasons, then, you know, all of that time that he spent in the world is waste. So it's important that always we check our ikhlas, our sincerity. So even if it is an act such as slaughtering an animal, and, uh, at the, you know, here we can't really understand that. But if we go back home, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Arab countries, where, you know, in the days of Eid, where they slaughter animals, you know, people, some people, just for show, just to show off in front of others, to show how much money they have, what they'll do is they'll buy the most expensive animal they can find. You know, sometimes the price of an animal reaches uh, 10,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds, and they'll come on the newspapers, they'll come on the news to show, look, this person has purchased and this animal is going to like sacrifice it. And these things, you know, in the eyes of Allah, Allah is the only one that can judge a person, truly. But if a person has done it without sincerity, then he's wasted all of that money okay, for, on, on the animal. Yeah. What did you find? Oh, uh, was, that, was that it? No, oh, okay, go on. Surah Ghashia, verses 2 and 3. Okay, Surah Ghashia, verse 2 and 3. Can you say the verses, please? Some faces and that they will be downcast, laboring, toiling. And okay, wujuhun yawma idhin khashia, amilatun nasiba. The days of judgment, people will be khashiatun, amilatun nasiba. Now, see, this is interesting because on the day of judgment, a person will be the biggest believer. All right, on the day of judgment, everyone is going to be forced to be the most, you know, the, the pious person. Why? Because it's too late. On the day of judgment, everything is going to be seen. So a person will have the most belief in Allah on the day of judgment. A person will 
see the, the punishment of Allah on the Day of Judgment, a person will try to do Tawbah on the Day of Judgment, all the things that are wanted from him in the dunya, he's going to be, try, he's going to be trying to fulfill them all on the, day, on the Day of Judgment. But they won't be accepted. So this is why it's important to understand that the Day of Judgment is not the time for deeds. Okay, it's a day of judgment, not a day of deeds. The day of deeds is dunya. Yeah, brother. Yeah, I've got to write down the Arabic surah. It's chapter 19, verse 51. He is truly sincere and was a messenger and a prophet. It refers to Musa, I think. Okay, kind of mukhlas, mukhlisa. Or kind of mukhlis. And there's several verses like that, that he was sincere. Very good, mashallah. Jazakallah khair. May Allah put barakah in your, in your time and your effort. And this is essentially, this is what, you know, like we say all the time, pondering over the Qur'an, reflecting over the Qur'an, reflecting over the Qur'an, pondering over the Qur'an, you know, researching the Qur'an is pondering over the Qur'an. When we start to think about the verses of the Qur'an, what we're trying to do is we're actively using our, our bodies, our minds, to try and become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And acting upon the verses of the Qur'an, which encourage and urge Muslims to ponder over the Qur'an. You know what's written there? Why did Allah Ta'ala send Musa salam to Bani Israel? How did he send them to Bani Israel? Why did Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala reveal this Qur'an over a period of time? You know, these are questions that we should have in our mind and questions we should search for in the Qur'an. And this will enable us to start thinking more. And this is something which is required of this Ummah. The more we think, the more we become human. The less we think, the less we become human. Okay, and this is what's happened today. Today, we are an ummah, a nation, but a stagnant nation. We're not an ummah, an active ummah. And the Sahaba were an active ummah. The Sahaba were not many in number. Compared to today, they were very few. But they were people of action. They were people, active people. They were people of thinking. So the more a person thinks, a more person reflects over the signs of Allah, and the verses of the Qur'an, what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables that person to execute more of the good deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of uh, You know, I think it's getting cold. It's getting cold. So I can just put the heating on. I'm turn it off for a while then. Okay, now, there's another question that I wanted to ask. Which is, the issue of sincerity itself is a very delicate issue because sincerity is something which a person should not boast about isn't it sincerity is something that you should keep in your hearts so this verse shows that we are openly stating that we are mukhlisun we are sincere to him so isn't this really going against the concept of concealing concealing our sincerity Yes, sister. Okay, very good. Sisters mentioned it, mashallah. Yeah, brothers, brothers are all baffled. Eh? <laughs> Sorry, the question is, ikhlas itself is something which is in the heart, something that should be concealed. I mean, like example I always give, right, the guy praying his salat, you know that famous example. And he praises Salat and people looking at him and they say, MashaAllah, look at the guy's ruku and his sujood. And then he turns to the guys and says, that I'm also fasting, you know. <laughs> okay, so this is going against the class, isn't it? Why? Because he's just said it. Okay, he's just made it apparent. So here, they are making it apparent that they are mukhlisun. <coughs> As believers, we are saying to them that we are sincere to, to Allah. So isn't this going against the the concept of ikhlas, conceding ikhlas. Yeah, yes sir? No. Hamza? Isn't the core of ikhlas being sincere to Allah? So now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding you to do something, then you do it. So here when he's commanding you to, to profess this, then you profess it. Okay, so Allah is commanding us to profess it. So obviously, because Allah is commanding us to profess it, we have to profess it. But generally, isn't the concept of ikhlas something that should be hidden? Why in this context is he telling us to, to profess it? 
That's the answer. The answer lies there. Why in this ayah is he telling us to, to, to openly to state? Is it because to be an example for the people of the book? Example for the people of the book? In what way? You know, like in previous ayahs we talked about the Sahaba the best of examples. Yeah. And was told to show the class in order to show the Jews and Christians. Okay, so um, I can understand what you're saying, but not really, it wouldn't really fit here. But you're almost there, because you have to look at the context of the verse. What's the verse? In which context is ikhlas needed? Okay, here the ayah revolves around which topic? Debate. Debate, isn't it? So in a debate, you have to make things clear. In a debate, you can't conceal, you can't try to hide, you can't try to... To show, uh, you know, conceal your ikhlas, you have to be clear, okay. And when it comes to certain times, a person has to put his foot down and make certain statements, uh, which normally he wouldn't make, okay. And this is something you can see in the lives of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, as well. One day, Umar radiyallahu anhu, he was he was a Khalifa, and he stood up and he was giving a a sermon, and one, someone stood up, Salman radiallahu anhu, and he said to Amir al Mu'minin that, you know, why are you wearing different clothes? Why are you wearing different clothes? You know, you, you divide, you distribute the clothes amongst us, and the clothes that you distribute was one pair of clothes to each person. Why are you wearing a different pair of clothes? How comes you're different than us? So Umar radiallahu anhu, he called his son who was in the crowd and said, Ya Abdullah, tell him. Tell him that this pair of clothes that I'm wearing are your clothes. And because I didn't have any clean clothes, I asked you if I can borrow your clothes. Tell him that they're your clothes. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu stood up and said, that my, These are my clothes. I borrowed them to my father. Okay, so they went quiet. So sometimes it's necessary for a person okay, to say certain things at certain times, which may in reality normal situations may not be used or may be looked down upon or may be considered to be certain things which a Muslim should not do but at certain times these things need to be done okay and sometimes in debates okay sometimes when we have to show our ikhlas or show our sincerity we have to state it and this is the core element here which divides us from them Okay, because if truly, if they were truly trying to search for the truth, okay, then they would have ikhlas inside of them. They would be debating for the sake of Allah, for the truth. And if they're not searching for the truth, then it means, like the previous ayahs say, that they are in schism, that they are separating, they are ripping away from the main group. Okay, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ikhlas as well. Okay, now, the verse of this week, أَمْ تَقُولُونَ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَصْبَاطَ كَانُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارَةً قُلْ أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ أَمِ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ كَتَمَ شَهَادَةً عِنْدَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Or are you saying that indeed Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Ya'qub and Al-Asbat were Jews or Christians. Say, are you more knowledge than Allah? And who is more of an oppressor or unjust than the one who conceals a witnessing with him from Allah? And Allah is not unaware of what you do. This is a loose translation of the verse. Now in this verse we can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is taking the issue from a different aspect, from a different angle. And in the verse we can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gone back to the issue of, the, the, of Ibrahim alayhi salam, of Ismail, Ishaq, etc. So first of all this verse, what we're going to do is going to mention the verse in four parts. <coughs> Four parts to this verse. Okay, four parts. The first part of this verse is Am taquluna inna Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq wa Yaqub wa Al Asbat kanu hudan aw nasara. This is the first part. The second part, 
قُلْ أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ أَمِ اللَّهِ The third part وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ كَتَمَ شَهَادَةً عِنْدَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ And the fourth part وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ So we'll discuss each part as we come to it. The first part Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that am Now here am in the Arabic language am Okay am It has two usages in the Arabic language. One is for when you're talking about two things. So like in English we say this or that. Okay, so here it can be translated as or. Meaning this or that. So, so it's connected to the previous verse <coughs> that are you debating with us and arguing with us regarding the religion of Allah to the end? Or are you saying that Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub and the Asbat were Jews and Christians? Okay, so it's referring to or. Oh, that's the first. Second is am um, here in the Arabic language is used for bal. Bal means rather. Rather, you're saying that Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yaqub and Asbat. Okay, so there's a slight difference there. One is or and one is rather. Okay, and this in the Mufassirin call this am al munqati'ah. Am al munqati'ah, meaning it has no connection with the previous statement. So it has no connection with the previous verse. There's no connection there. It doesn't mean this or that. Rather, what it means, it's a list of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning. Bal, taquluna inna Ibrahima. That's the first thing. Second, is now taquluna. Taquluna, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now talking directly to the Jews and the Christians. And it's saying that you, are you saying, are you saying Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, Asbat were Jews and Christians? Now, we mentioned this previously a few weeks ago where we said that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Ibrahim alayhi salam is not a Jew, is not a Christian, but he's a okay, Muslim. Hanifa Muslim. He wasn't from amongst the politicists. Now, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reiterating this again? Why would he repeat this? Why would he say to them directly? If you go back to the previous verse, okay, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> Verse 135. Yes, sister. Sorry? Okay, yeah. So if you go back to the verse again, over there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they say, be a Jew or a Christian, you'll be guided. Say rather the, the religion or the millah of Ibrahim, Hanifa, wa ma kana mil mushrikeen. He wasn't from amongst the mushrikeen. Over there he's. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that this is what they say, okay, for guidance. Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them that, do you say that Ibrahim and Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, Asbat were Jews and Christians? Why would he say that? Because in the previous ayah, he says that you're debating about oh. this issue. Okay, so you're debating about this issue. So I'm just trying to remind you that. All right, so, so as a reminder, yeah. that's possibly true. But... Any common Jew, any Jew or Christian with common sense, wouldn't they say that obviously Ibrahim was not a Jew? And obviously he was not a Christian because the Jewish and Christian name developed later. Okay, it was something which was established much later after these, uh, the, the sons, Ibrahim Islam and his sons. So why, why was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to them? Would they say that? There are no answers, eh? And a few answers. And so whether... Probably Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deny them um, whatever their views and the finalize them. Okay, I know better than you. And I'm telling that he's not Jewish and he's, he was not there. Okay, yeah, that's, that is coming up later. But why is he saying to them, okay, that you're saying 
okay, that you're saying that these people were Jews and Christians. Would they really say that? Would they? They're not saying it directly, though. They're more saying that we have more of an affinity to Ibrahim and Islam than you have. Okay, yes, sister? Okay, very good. Okay, so sister mentioned a good point where when the Musa salam came or after Musa salam came, then they called themselves the Jew Jews. And when Isa salam came, they called themselves Christians. So now because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has come, they should call themselves Muslims. Okay, so good, good point. Yeah, what did you say, Hamza? Uh, no, they're not directly saying that they're... Okay, yeah. So the Mufassirin have mentioned <coughs> two opinions regarding this verse. One is that the Jews, okay, out of jahala, out of ignorance, they are really saying that Ibrahim salam and all of his offspring, they were Jews. And the Christians are saying that Ibrahim salam and his offspring were all Christians. Now, obviously, that wouldn't make sense. But the way they are saying it, is that their core beliefs are exactly the same core beliefs as the Jews and the Christians. Therefore, they deserve to have the name Jew. And therefore, they deserve to have the name Christian. Do you understand that? Okay. So what they're saying, they're not saying, in reality, they're not saying that these were the people who introduced the name Jews, Judaism or Christianity. But what they're saying is that because... The guidance is only uh, uh, exclusive to Judaism or guidance is only exclusive to Christianity then it means that the Jews forefathers i.e. Ibrahim salam, Ismail, Ishaq etc they must have been Jews their beliefs must have coincided with our beliefs Do you understand that? now why would this come about? Why would they go so far to try and superimpose their own beliefs or their own lifestyles and rituals onto these noble prophets? So they don't have to change anything. So they don't have to change anything? Possibly. Yeah. Is it because they feel they get more credence? So they credence, that's a good point as well. And this is what people do to become more <laughs> famous. And usually it's in literature. Okay, for a book to become famous, all you have to do is you have to say some famous guy wrote it and you'll get loads of copies sold. Okay, so write a book at home and just say, you know, Einstein wrote this. And immediately you'll get a rush of people buying it. Later on they'll find out that it's wrong, but you'll make all your money. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. What else? What makes a person? Now, I'll give you an example. When the Prophet ﷺ, when he entered into the Kaaba, when he went for Fatah Makkah, conquering Makkah, and he went and he opened the Kaaba, he came inside. The narrations mentioned that he saw a picture of supposed, supposedly Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he was holding in his hand arrows. And these were what they used to do in them, them days, divine arrows. And it was like um, a fortune telling system. Okay, meaning that they believed that Ibrahim alayhi salam used to do fortune telling. Just as they do fortune telling. Okay, so why do why do people generally, why do they go to so extreme, so such extremes, that they superimpose their own beliefs onto predecessors? Yeah. So I mean, one after even they can rule. I mean, they can go for the, uh, a lot of uh, nations. They want that. Okay, if you follow us, we will rule the world or something like that. That's also one of the reasons. Yeah, but, but my question is, sorry, I, I, I should have put the question a different way. Mm -hmm. The question should have been, is that what makes them do this? Do you think that Jews or Christians in their right mind would really sit down and say, okay, let's make it up now. Let's say Ibrahim was a Christian. Or let's say 
the Jews say, let's say Ibrahim was a Jew. Would anyone really do that? Would any real sincere Christian or Jew do that? I mean, there may be a few individuals here and there who are corrupt and... But generally, they wouldn't do that, would they? And the Mushrikun wouldn't do that. I mean, the Mushrikun would have sincerely believed that, yeah, you know, Ibrahim he was a Mushrik as well, like us. He used to do all of these things. So what makes them, the people hold such beliefs about their predecessors? They're trying to be defensive. Defensive. Not, not all the time. Uh, are they trying to strengthen their beliefs? Strengthen their beliefs, definitely. But what makes, what makes a person reach that level where he, where he starts to claim these things? Probably they saw their forefathers was doing one day, they were saying they were right, we are right. Okay, very good. That's one issue. That seeing the forefathers. Okay, and this is what Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. Inna wajadna aba'ana ala ummah. That we saw our forefathers on a, a, a method, methodology. So we're just following them. You also like change. People don't like change. People don't like change. Yeah. Possibly. Okay, not all the time. But it depends what kind of change as well. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, and this is what Allah Ta'ala is indicating towards. Lack of knowledge. When knowledge, when people become deprived of true divine knowledge, and they don't refer their issues back to the divine sources. What happens is that people's ideologies, people's beliefs begin to become mixed up. And culture and thought and imagination mixes with beliefs. And at the end of it, what's the result? The result is a aqidah, which they think is the true aqidah. They think is the true beliefs. And this is why if we look at Islam, Islam in Islam, we always have to refer everything back to Allah and His Messenger. Everything has to be measured with the Quran and Sunnah. Any issue we have in our religion has to be measured with the Quran and the Sunnah. And the less we measure our issues with the Quran and Sunnah, then the less closer we are towards the truth. And the less we measure our issues with the Quran and Sunnah, the more what comes out of that? No? The less we, we compare our issues with the Quran and Sunnah, what comes out of that? Misguidance. Misguidance, or more specifically? Bid'ah, Bid innovation. Okay, so all of these religions have been prone to innovation. And this is going back to the issue of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was the core man in history. He was a man who laid down a foundation which even this ummah has to follow. And that, um, that concept or that foundation is summed up in the word Hanifa. Hanifa is critically thinking. Every issue that comes to us, we have to think about it. It's not just a matter of just accepting it and taking it and that's it. We have to be able to critically analyze it. And this is why Ibrahim salam, if you remember what we mentioned, is that when he, his people used to worship the stars, the moons and the, and the sun. You know, these uh, the bodies of the skies so what he did was one day he looked at the stars and he said that this is my Lord okay let's say this is my Lord and the stars disappeared he goes this can't be my Lord something that disappears at one time and appears the Lord can never disappear the true Rob of the universe who is managing the universe he can never disappear so he can't be the Rob then he looked at the moon and said okay these people claim the moon is the Rob the moon can't be the Rob why? Because the moon also has phases and disappears at some point. And then he looked at the sun, which is the biggest, you know, the biggest uh, uh, object in the, in the skies. And said, this has to be the Lord. And then when it, it, it set and it disappeared from the horizon, he said, this can't be the Lord. Inni wajahtu wajhiya lilladhi fataras samawati wal ard. Hanifa. He goes, I turn my face to the one who has created the heavens and the earth <coughs> whilst going back all the time and this is why this is the core issue like we said before remember we said that whoever Allah says that whoever leaves the millet of Ibrahim what happens to him what happens to him they neglected disgraced and No, not schism.
we said that a person who who leaves the millet of Ibrahim ultimately that person will be disgraced okay he'll become a fool why because he's taking himself away from the the main cr critical aspect of the religion which is Hanifa Hanifiya and this is why the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was commanded okay that follow the millet of Ibrahim it to be millet Ibrahim Hanifa Follow the millet of Ibrahim, Hanifan. Hanifan meaning that you're always searching for the truth. You're always going for the truth. And now if we look at our ummah today, all the problems that have come in our ummah today are problems which revolve around us, you know, becoming far and further and further away from Hanifi. The further we go away from the, our main religious sources, the Quran and the Sunnah, what happens is, other things will take their place. And those things are either going to be issues which are bid'ah, and more extreme, there will be things that go to shirk. All right? And this is what Allah Ta'ala is warning us about. And this is what happened to their religion. Because if we think about it, no Jew in his right mind would commit shirk. Because they believe in the oneness of Allah. No real Christian says that he does shirk. If you ask a Christian, are you a polytheist or a monotheist? What would he say to you? monotheist isn't it he the christian claims that he's on tawheed you ask him and he'll give you a big bayan on tawheed you ask a jew and he'll give you a big bayan on tawheed okay the, even the mushriks the mushriks many of them they even they they say we worship one allah but we only worship these idols so that they can bring us closer to allah okay so why what's the difference between us and them the difference between us and them is that we are holding fast to this concept. Okay, so تَقُولُونَ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَسْبَاتِ كَانُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا Are you saying that? Are you saying that these people are Yehud and they were Nasara? Okay, and we mentioned this before many times, Hudan أَوْ Nasara. It doesn't mean that they were Jews or Christians. It means the Jews claim that they were Jews and the Christians claim that they were Christians. So instead of having a long sentence, the, what the Arabs do is they summarize the sentence. And this is one of the unique uh, aspects of the Quran, where a long sentence would easily be brought into a few words. And these few words would have deep meaning. Ibrahim, we mentioned about Ibrahim, we mentioned about Ismail, we mentioned about Ishaq, Yaqub, Asbat, Asbat. What did we say about Asbat? Okay, the tribes, the sons, the tribes of Bani Israel, which came from the offspring of Yaqub alayhi salam. So Yaqub alayhi salam had 12 offspring. And the tribes that came from them are called Asbat. Okay, Sibt. This is the first interpretation that the Mufassirin have given. The second interpretation that the Mufassirin have given is that <coughs> the Jews don't say Ibrahim alayhi salam is a Jew. And the Christians, they don't say that Ibrahim alayhi salam and his offspring are Christians. Rather, their practices imply that it's as though they believe that their religion is more true. And hence, what this is trying to say is that it's indirectly, they're trying to say that Ibrahim alayhi salam was a Jew uh, or Ibrahim alayhi salam was a Christian. So they're not directly saying that they were Jews or Christians. Rather, what it is, is that their practices are so firm, or they're so firm on their own lifestyle and beliefs, that it's as though they are indirectly saying that, yeah, Ibrahim alayhi salam was like us, he was a Jew. Or Ibrahim alayhi salam was like us, like, he was a Christian. Do you understand that? So this was the second. And this is also something which is a problem in our ummah. Okay, the big problem in our ummah today. And the reason for that is because many of us, our practices are such that when people look at us, they'll say that, oh, the Sahaba were like you. Oh, the Sahaba were like you. They used to con people. They used to break their promises. They never used to fulfill their, 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 their oaths. They were people who used to try to cheat with Allah. Is that what you're trying to say? Sahaba were like... And this is the impression that people get. 
Okay, unfortunately, this is the case. If you go today, all right, and you go out, you go to where many Muslims are living, and you see the condition of the Muslims, and you put yourself in the shoes of a non-believer, and it's the first time you've ever come in contact with a Muslim, and they were to visit a few Muslims, what is the likelihood, and what is the, 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 the chance that this non-believer will meet a good practicing believer? Today, let's say in Birmingham or in any other city where there's many Muslims, what's the likelihood that they'll meet a Muslim brother or a Muslim sister who is five times Salat regular, who is humble, who has the characteristics like a Sahabi? What are the chances that they will meet one of those? And when they do meet a Muslim, what do they say? Do they come back with good, good reviews? You know, you get reviews on the internet. Someone's put an article up and underneath you get loads of reviews. What's the likelihood that their reviews will be five-star reviews? Or reviews that they, they liked it? Okay, I don't think that will be the case. And this is why when the non-Muslims look at us, and they take it all the way back to the Prophet They say their Prophet must have been like that. Their religion teaches them this. And this is why it's important that we show to the world as well our religion okay practically not just in, in internally unfortunately today what's happened is that we become pious in the masjid we become pious in the masjid we come into the masjid mashallah we'll do a wudu nice and and, and with khushu and khudu okay we'll come we'll pray our salat we'll be calm we won't speak Anyone speaking in the masjid will tell them to go quiet. All right, we'll have adab or reciting the Quran. We we'll listen to the talk of the Shaykh. Go to the Juma. After we exit the door, back to our old ways. There's no difference between us and a person who's not practicing. And this is the, the, the sad truth. The sad truth is the Christians and the Jews, the way they live their religions is giving a bad impression on Ibrahim alayhi salam on Ishaq and Ismail Similarly, the way the Muslims today are living their religion is giving a bad example, a bad impression of the noble Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Imagine one of them was to see our lives today. Do you, what do you think Umar would say if he saw our lives today? Never mind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the day of judgment we'll have to face facts. But let's just think. And this is why our teacher, one of our teachers used to say, that a person should always try to think whenever he's about to do a deed or anything he should try to think if my teacher was standing here would I do this? if my teacher was standing here today would I really do this? if he was to see me doing this or saying this would he be happy? And because this is how nowadays we should measure ourselves because if he is not happy okay then imagine what Allah would think how can we do that deed when we know that Allah is watching us 24-7? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding of this. Mm -hmm. And here in this verse, both of the meanings can apply. And this is the beauty of the Qur'an. This is why the Mufassirin say that the Qur'an is not like any other book where a sentence or a statement implies only one meaning. Sometimes the one of the verses of the Qur'an can imply several meanings. Okay, and this is why the Qur'an is so versatile in its, in, in its, in its meanings. Now, <coughs> those were the, the two opinions that Mufassir mentioned. Who then, O Nasara? So this was the first aspect of the verse. Okay, that, are you saying that Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, Asbat, Kanu, who then, O Nasara? Okay, now, if we, if we look at the previous verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them, that are you debating, are you arguing with us about the religion of Allah, isn't it? Saying that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the argument by saying, look, what's the point of arguing? The same Rabb is our Rabb, the same Rabb is your Rabb. You have your deeds, we have our deeds. The only person whose deeds will be correct are those with ikhlas, which is us. Okay, so that is an argument, separate argument. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking the the issue from another aspect, 
from another angle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, oh, are you saying this? That Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, Asbat, all Jews and Christians. Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would use this approach? Why would he present an argument, first of all, in that way? And then why would he present an argument in this way? Or is the question too hard? Is it to explain it in a different way so they understand? Explain in a different way? Okay, what's... You have to look at the argument. What is the argument there? What is the argument here? Okay, what I'll do is... I'll let you to think about it. In pairs, think about it. What's the argument mentioned over there? What's the argument mentioned over here? Why mention that over there and why mention this over here? So if you can do that in pairs, okay, or in groups of threes or whatever, just to think about it. Yeah, so one, three, nine, okay, and this one, 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 forty, just to know. What's the argument that's mentioned over there? What's the argument mentioned over here? Why uh, mention the two arguments one after the other? Okay, yeah. Let's uh, see see what answers you guys are coming with. Okay, so who wants to go first? You go first, go on. <laughs> At the beginning, uh, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuting the claim that they claim good regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because that, that's one aspect of Akira. Okay, so what, what what is the argument there? The argument there is regarding the rub. They're saying that. Then we go back to it. <laughs> so what I want to know is what is the argument there? What is the argument here? How has Allah uh, uh, refuted the argument there? Or answered the argument there? And how has He answered it here? They're the saying that Allah is ours. Kind of. Okay, so exclusiveness here. Yeah? Yeah. So they are exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, here? then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them that. And what's the argument here, first of all? Here, uh, I, um, I believe, is because that, that's regarding Allah, and then this is regarding the Prophets, the same, these are all our Prophets now. This is Ibrahim, he's our Ibrahim. It's not your Ibrahim. Okay, very good. So here, he's mentioning that he's our Ibrahim, very good. Okay, let's go to the next one. You talk ahead, sir. Basically, he's saying the same sort of thing where Allah SWT first of all talks about, you know, the all the religions are saying that the Lord is always one. Now he's saying all the prophets were all the same. And all the prophets belong to all the same. Okay, very good. So all the prophets are all the same over here. <coughs> yeah, but what's okay, what's their argument then? Is that we're, we're right when it comes to the Lord of being of the Lord of all lords. And we're also right when it comes to the prophets being the pro prophets of all Okay, prophets. very good. Yeah. Next. Yeah, I mean, they, they were claiming that they are the true. Um, Followers of the Ibrahim al Islam, yeah. Allah said that now that uh, they were, he was not blind, he was a true Muslim. And here that um, Allah subhanahu wa is make a, I mean, finalizing the decision, okay, this, this uh, Ibrahim al Islam blind to Muslim, and you know, I know better than you are. Okay, okay, well, what's the argument? What, what's the argument in the first verse? What's the argument? What claim are they making? But they are claiming that. Uh, we are the true followers of Ibrahim We are the true followers of Ibrahim mm -hmm. And the second verse? Oh, so the second verse is that we are the true followers? Yes, second verse. Yes. Okay, and the, and the first? First, that's, that's, that, I mean, I mean, we are the selected, I, I couldn't to be honest, understand. Okay, no problem. no problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. one second, sister. Yes, yeah, sister, did you find anything? Okay, so our religion is authentic and old. Oh. Ah. Okay, so the first verse is related to believing in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's interesting. Yeah, go on. Uh, you were just saying that it's about taking it at different levels, first starting from 
the belief in Allah and uh, of then taking you down to the level of the Prophets. Okay, so first with regards to Allah, then the Prophets, very good, yeah. Uh, Abhisab? Well, it's been identical to what these guys have said. Okay, <laughs> so is that Amin? Amin to what they say. <laughs> Anything to add? No, to be honest, more I mean, see, what it is, is, is what, what we should try and do is, is we should try and think for ourselves. No, I'm not, I'm not saying you didn't think. You did think definitely. But this exercise enables a person to be able to think what he has to say about it. Okay, and if you do this in front of a teacher, at least the teacher can correct us. This shouldn't be something which, you know, we do in front of the public because we'll come up with all sorts of answers, okay? But what we should do in front of someone who is, who is uh, uh, practiced in this and who has some understanding in this, in front of them we should try and do this. So at least we should present to them, that, okay, look, I understood this, is this correct? So the teacher would be able to correct the student, okay? Like just as the Sahabi, okay, who, Adi ibn Hatim, who... Uh, he placed, you know, two strings next to his pillow and he waited for Fajr. So he came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I waited all night. Fajr came, the sun rose, the thread, that I, the two pieces of thread I put next to my pillow, the black thread and the white thread, they didn't become distinguished. And I've read in the Quran that Allah Ta'ala says that eat and drink until the black thread and the white thread become distinguished from one another. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, your pillow must be as big as the horizon because the black and white thread are not real threads. They're referring to the, the white line in the horizon. So this was a Sahab who was trying to think okay, of the verse. But when he presented it to his teacher, the Prophet ﷺ, he corrected him. Yeah? You guys? <coughs> well, I understood it was that. Or what's, the, what's the claim? What's the claim? In the, what, what do you see as the claim? In the first one, they're trying to claim exclusivity for Allah SWT. Very in good. the second one, now Allah SWT is, in a way, more harshly rebuking them, saying, look, you even claim exclusivity for the prophets. Yeah. But now I'm telling you that, no. Okay, very good. So that's exclusively to, 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 all, to them. Allah is exclusive to them. And the second verse is exclusiveness to the prophets. Very good, mashallah. May Allah put barakah in your ilm. Okay, was there any other answers upstairs? No? Okay. Now, if we think about it, what are the two claims that's being made? The first claim that's being made is that they are arguing with us with regards to which religion is correct. They're saying that they are correct. Okay, and therefore they're saying that they're the only ones who enter Jannah. And this was previously uh, stated earlier when they said that be a Jew and you'll, enter, you'll be guided. So this was what they were saying, wasn't it? And in the second verse it's mentioned that to support this claim that they are on guidance, to further support this claim that they are on guidance, they've even tried to uh, bring evidence that Ibrahim and all of his offspring were on this path. Okay, so ultimately what they were trying to do is support the initial claim which is that they are on guidance and the only way that they can really prove that they were on guidance is if previously there were some other people who were on this uh, manhaj or on this methodology previously and that's why they resorted to try and prove that Ibrahim was on this, Ismail was on this, all of them were on this and therefore our claim must be true so it's as though they claim the first claim, uh, second claim is built on the first claim, or is in support of the first claim. And the reason that they really didn't want to believe that Islam was true is because <coughs> their beliefs had become so distorted. And this is why Allah Ta'ala before that, He presented their beliefs to them and says, Qulu amanna billah, Say that we believe in Allah, wa ma unzila ilayna, and that which has been revealed to us, that which has been revealed to you. And we believe in Ibrahim and Ismail, oh, that's been, that which has been revealed to them. La no bain ahad minhum. We don't differentiate between any one of them. Wa nahnu lahu muslimun. And we are believers to him. Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if they believe like you've believed, then they're on guidance. Why is he mentioning that? Because their beliefs are so distorted 
that the whole blueprint of beliefs has to be laid out in front of them again. Now look, this is the blueprint of belief you have to believe. Okay, this is what you have to be on. Your beliefs are so distorted that now you have to be told from fresh. And so this was the first claim that Allah refuted. Now look, you can't, you can't say that Allah is exclusive to you. You can't say that because He's our Lord as well. And if you say that, oh well, Ibrahim, Ismail and all of them were on our religion as well, that's wrong as well. You understand that? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the next part of us. Okay, we'll stop there. Stop for five minutes, have a rest. Okay, you can have a rest, walk around, and then continue afterwards, inshallah. Okay, now. <clears throat> okay, so, so we've covered the first part of the verse, okay. Uh, <coughs> now, there's one issue which I didn't mention in this verse, which is, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions with Ibrahim alayhi salam, he mentions Ismail alayhi salam also. And if we look earlier, uh, if you look at verse number uh, 136, over there Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam and Ishaq alayhi salam are also mentioned again. And uh, before that, okay, if we, if we look further before that, we see that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions verse 133, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ismail alayhi salam and Ishaq alayhi salam. All three of these are mentioned. Okay, all three of the of, of the, the father and the two sons are mentioned. The question is if the issue is with regards to Bani Israel, then why mention Ismail alayhi salam in the equation? Because if we think about it, Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. Ismail alayhi salam was uh, brought up in Mecca and became the father of the Arabs and be a prophet of the Arabs and Ishaq alayhi salam was actually the, 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 the main uh, link between Ibrahim alayhi salam and the Jews so why mention Ismail alayhi salam in these verses? Uh, this is one of the days for the Jewish not believing Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam because he came from uh, that Ismail alayhi salam generation, yes. and they thought it, they, they thought it that Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam come with the Hazrat Isaq alayhi salam generation. So one of the base for the jealous for that one that because of you are coming from that Ismail alayhi salam generation, yeah. so that's why we are not accepting. But Allah is mentioning to him that uh, the, the, uh, Allah is mentioning both of them and refusing their their debate or something. Like that. Okay, so he was part of that lineage as well. So therefore, mm -hmm. you have to believe in him as well. Yep, mm -hmm. well, sister. What did you, were you, do you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, so it means the whole Ummah, yeah? The Muslims, Jews and the Christians. So they're all interrelated. Okay, even the Jews and the, the Muslims have some link between them, which goes back to Ismail and Ishaq alayhi salam. Any other answers? I was going to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just basically telling the Jews to stop, re refrain from differentiating between the prophets and believe in them all rather than believing just one who might come in their time. Okay, so refrain from differentiating between prophets possibly. But that was something early on we mentioned as well. Okay, but this here that really wouldn't be understood from the verse directly. Is it what you mentioned before about debating that when you debate with someone you bring common ground in? Yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. So this is an issue of debating. And common ground has to be mentioned. So when you're debating with someone, and obviously, for example, if you're debating with a, an atheist, you'd mention evidences which he would accept and you would accept as well, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say to him, well, brother or friend, in the Quran it says this. Say, Look, I don't believe in the Quran. That's what he would say, wouldn't he? He would say to you, I don't believe in the Qur'an, why are you bringing evidence from the Qur'an? So it would be silly for a person to try and debate with a person without being on common, common ground. So here as one well, is that they believe, they are on common ground. The common ground that they believe in is Ibrahim, they accept Ibrahim alayhi salam. They accept Ismail alayhi salam. They accept Ishaq alayhi salam. If they accept all of these, 
okay, then it means that there must be some truth in Islam. That's one thing. And secondly, if you look at the verse itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them, do you say that Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, Aspat were Jews? And you, earlier you said only Jews can enter Jannah. So it means if Ismail is a Jew, it means that he must have propagated the Jewish beliefs in the Arabs. So it must, it must mean that the Arabs are also guided. Do you understand? Did they believe Ishmael is being a prophet? Yeah, Ishmael. Oh, oh yeah, of course. So they believe that. So if you're saying that, yeah, Ismail was a Jew, and he was brought up in Mecca, and he was a prophet for the Arabs, and from his lineage came the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he must be guided. According to your own argument, okay, we must be on guidance. Do you understand that? And previously also, that, that was something mentioned. So, تَقُولُونَ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ وَإِسْحَاقُ وَيَعْقُوبُ الْأَسْبَاتِ كَانُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارَ The second part of the verse. قُلْ أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ أَمِ اللَّهِ Say, are you more knowledge, O Allah? Are you more knowledge, O Allah? Now, like we said before, am here means or. Am, it's originally am, but because there's a sak in there, sukun, the, the, the rule is, that a sukun is taharaka taharaka bil kasra. Okay, that a sukun, when a sukun appears and you need to link it onto the next word, then you add a kasra to it. A zero we call kasra. So amilla. Am Allah. Amilla. So here it means or. Qul say. Antum a'lam amilla. Again the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is commanded to say this to them. Are you more knowledged or Allah? <laughs> now this is a question, isn't it? Are you more knowledge or Allah? What do you think the answer is going to be? Allah is more Obviously Allah is more knowledgeable, isn't it? So why does Allah mention this question then? If the obvious answer is going to be that Allah is more knowledgeable, then why pose this question to them? Is it again to say that this isn't coming from me, it's from Allah? And you can't argue against it. Okay, so this isn't coming from me, but it's from Allah. Yes, sister? Sorry? Yeah, okay, dantna, okay, tawbikh, telling someone off, as I said it. But what, what do we call this kind of a question? Rhetorical. rhetorical. And when do we, do we use rhetorical questions? Somebody who's dumb. No, not really. If they're dumb, then you don't <laughs> really want to speak to them. When you don't need an answer back, you just make it. You don't need the answer back? And you want to reflect. Reflecting. You want them to reflect. Okay. So when you want someone to reflect, you say to them, you give them a rhetorical question. Yes, sister? Sorry, yeah. A good, that's a good question there. The sister, say, the sister said that the Jews and Christians don't believe in the Quran. Okay? The Jews, the, the, the Jews don't believe in the Quran. So how can the, the, uh, the Prophet Wasallam say to them that, is Allah more knowledge? Or you, okay? Because the Prophet ﷺ has received this information through Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, hasn't he? In the Quran, therefore, how can we use this as evidence against them? Does anyone have an answer? What was the question? The question, the question was. It's not rhetorical. <laughs> it's a true question. The true question is that when we say that. Because the questions are quite deep. Okay, that if we say that Allah, are you more knowledge than Allah? Okay, then we ask the next question, that how do we know that Allah is more knowledge? Meaning that the verses that Allah has revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to present these to the Jews. And so the Jews will say to him, well, we don't believe in the Quran. So how can you say to us that Allah knows this? Do you understand that? Okay, so the sister asked this question. Does anyone know answer before I try to answer it? I think probably. I don't know if exactly, but I mean, there's Allah providing the evidence after all evidence and um, the Mashaida and every, and I put it every evidence, then Allah is saying that Allah is more knowledgeable. So it's already debate on there, it's already answer on them. After that, that you see that can But what, what if they say, well, we don't believe? 
in the Quran. And they say, look, Allah has mentioned this in the Quran, and like you guys claim, yes. but we don't believe in the Quran. But that's a common sense, common evidence. Okay, okay very good. The common sense can accept, okay, whatever the evidence is. That's, that's, that's the Quran. answer. Okay, the answer is, is that this is something which is common sense, isn't it? <coughs> this is common sense. Meaning that if you claim that Ibrahim was a Jew, common sense will tell you that that's wrong, totally wrong. Whether you claim it directly or indirectly, that's totally wrong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not answering them through something which is in the ghayb, which no one knows except for Allah. He's answering them according to their own understanding. Do you understand that? So they don't, even if they didn't, don't believe in the Quran, they still have to answer this argument. They still are unable to answer this argument or this claim or this evidence that Ibrahim was not a Jew and his offspring were not Jews. So how can you claim that they were Jews? Okay, now. Okay, Are you more knowledge or Allah? More knowledge in what? More knowledge in, in what? Meaning, are you more knowledge in the fact that Ibrahim was a Jew? Are you more knowledge? Or is Allah more knowledge when Allah says that he wasn't a Jew? Or are you more knowledge in the fact that you claim that only Jews would enter Jannah? Or is Allah more knowledge that anyone who fulfills the criteria that he's mentioned will enter Jannah? Who is more knowledge? Now obviously they would have to surrender and say, definitely Allah is more knowledge. So here we can see that Allah, the, 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 the Jews are presented with a rhetorical question. And this rhetorical question is something for them to think about. Each one of them to think about. Is it also a closed question as well? So Sorry? Closed, there's no debate. Okay, so that would mean it would, there is no debate. Yeah. Meaning that telling them off. Like for example, a father, you know, the, the, the son has taken the father's car keys and opened the car, sat in the car and playing the horn and playing with the car and starting up. And the father comes to him and says to him, did I tell you to use the car? Did I tell you to take my keys and open the door and sit in the car and start the engine? Now obviously the, the son hasn't been told, so it's a telling off. Okay, it's a way of telling someone off. And this is what, what is seen in the Quran many times. Okay, now, أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ أَمِ That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it. أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ أَمِ Here is an indication that our knowledge, everything that we have, we have to surrender it to Allah. We can't use our intellects, we can't use our rational, we can't use our thinking when it comes to Allah. It means that just as we surrender our bodies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's in salat, whether it's in fasting, whether it's in any other act of worship, our minds are surrendered to Allah as well. Our knowledge is surrendered to Allah. And here's an indication that they were trying to use their own intellects uh, against Allah. Challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indirectly with their own understanding. And bringing out their own beliefs, bringing out their own aqidah, bringing out their own ways of life. They, all of this was invented from there. There was no delete from this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that are you more knowledge than Allah? Okay, indicating again that a person should surrender himself not only physically but also in knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly is that all of our knowledge, all of the knowledge which is related to our sharia, it has to come directly from Allah. Okay, knowledge of the dunya, it can be something which you know we can take from experience, from testing, from other, uh, other people's uh, experiments. But when it comes to knowledge of Sharia, experiments don't work. Experience does not work. Observations don't work. It has to be di direct revelation from Allah. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once when he came to Medina, he came and he saw them grafting date palms. Ta'birul Nakhal. Grafting date palms. Grafting date palms, if, if any of you have seen it, what they do is a date palm it requires a male and fem a female parts. So what they do is they, they, they cut holes or, or, or long lines in the, the bark of date palms. And they take a male specimen from another tree or a female and they place them in that tree. 
Okay, so they take a male part of a tree and they place it into the female, into the tree. And then what happens is that that enables the fruit of that tree to, 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 to increase. Okay, so it's a sort of fertilization. Okay, artificial way of fertilizing the tree. And this was something that the Arabs would do. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he, after Hijrah, when he came to Medina and he saw that they were doing this, he asked them that, do you really need to do that? Do you people really need to you know, do this ta'bir, grafting? Can't you just leave the tree as it is and like other things? So they heard the Prophet ﷺ say this, so that year they didn't do it. And when the harvest came, the harvest was, was not that, that much. So they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, you told us not to do this, look at our harvest. Nothing's come this year. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them that I am only a messenger. I am only a human and I am a messenger of Allah. If I command you to do something with regards to your religion, then you have to obey. But if I command you something to do with regards to your worldly issues, then it's my opinion regarding it. Okay? It's my opinion and I am only a human. So this is why it's important for us when it comes to religious issues, when it comes to us in our ibadat, when it comes to us with regards to relating with other people, when it comes to us with regards to establishment of Islamic society, when it comes to us uh, with regards to our knowledge, then we have to take it from its source. The source was the Prophet Sahaba, and the Sahaba took it from the Prophet Wasallam, and the Prophet Wasallam took it from Jibreel who took it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so it's important that our knowledge comes from the direct source which is Allah. أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمْ أَمِ And this is why these religions out there, okay, especially the, the mushrikeen, the polytheists, all of these idols, the names of these idols that they've invented, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that in here illa asma, the only names you know, this God is called this, this is called this, this is called this. They're only names. Names which you have invented. No permission came from it from me. There was no permission at all for you to worship these idols and to name them by these names. It's all something you people invented from yourselves. And this is what happens. When we go away from the sources, original sources, all these names come about. Okay, not only names come about, actions come about, beliefs come about. And this is why it's very important for us to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the second part of this. The third part. And who is more oppressing? Who is more unjust? Than the one who conceals testimony or witnessing with him from Allah. Now, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the third issue, which is that these people are concealing a testimony. Okay, they're concealing a testimony. Why does Allah ta'ala say that they're concealing a testimony? What is the testimony, first of all? Yes, sister? Okay, the... the, the I won't mention it to the brothers. Brothers have to figure it out. Testimony of faith. Testimony of faith. But they've already, haven't they laid down their faith already? The, the prophecy of the Messenger Okay, the prophecy of the Messenger very good, which the sister mentioned. <coughs> Anything else? What else could it be? That the earlier prophets were mostly uh, believing Islam. Yeah, the, the Okay, so concealing the truth about that Ibrahim salam, was not really a Jew, but he was really someone who was on the monotheist faith, according to how it's mentioned in their books. Yeah, oh. concealing the reality of what's in their books. Concealing the reality of what's in their books. Okay, meaning taking things out of context. That as well. Anything else? Taking the core beliefs. The core beliefs. What is the core beliefs? But don't they lay that down already? Don't they believe in that as well? Okay, now, Mufassirin have given several interpretations to this verse. So, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمْ مِمَّنْ كَتَمَ الشَّهَادَةِ 
The shahada that they refer to here, number one, some of the Mufassirin have mentioned is the shahada or the testimony of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming, which is mentioned in their books. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that Isa alayhi salam says to, to his people that وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ Okay, that I am a messenger of Allah and I am telling you people, I am giving you good news, glad tidings of a messenger who will come after me by the name of Ahmad. And Ahmad was the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. Okay, that this Prophet will come and this is something which is mentioned in their books. But because they concealed it, okay, it was as though they are concealing witness. That's one. Number two, is Katama Shahada is referring to the fact that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, all of these were on the true faith. They weren't Jews, they weren't Christians, but this is what they were upon. Do you understand that? Number three, okay, is slightly different. So the first two is something that they really are concealing. That they really are concealing some true facts. Number three, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the same verse. That if you're saying that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, Ishaq alayhi salam were Jews, okay, if you're really saying that, then where's the evidence? Oh, are you hiding it? Are you hiding that they were Jews or Christians? All oh, right, you're hiding it, yeah? So it's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sarcastically saying to them, that are you hiding it? That obviously they're not hiding it because they don't have any evidence. Okay, so it's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them that are you really hiding this information from us? This information is like a testimony. You should tell everyone. You should show it to everyone. Do you understand that? So these are the three main uh, opinions or, uh, or interpretations that the Mufassirin have mentioned. Now, with regards to what was said early on, the book itself, in, the, in their books it's mentioned that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ will appear. And this was something which many of the Sahaba were waiting for. Like when the Prophet ﷺ, he, accept, he, he was given the first wahi and he came down and Khadija radiallahu anha took, took him to her cousin who was Nawfal, okay, Waraqa bin Nawfal. And he presented him and he was a Christian in Makkah. And he said to him, if you are true in what you're saying, then you are the prophet. The promised mes the messenger, okay, you are the one. He even gave testimony. And similarly, Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a rabbi in Medina, when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him that you are definitely the prophet. And it's, you are mentioned in our books. And when Salman al-Farsi, when he was on his long journey in finding the truth one of the priests told him to go to Medina and wait there because the last messenger would appear there and he found him and he came to him and he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said you know I've been searching for you and you are the true messenger so it's mentioned in their books however what they do is they conceal it they conceal it and they distort it and because of this it's as though they are concealing the witnessing now the next question is, why does Allah refer to this information as a shahada, as a testimony? Why not say, man katama ilman, or man katama khabaran, the one who conceals knowledge, or the one who conceals news or information. Why call it a testimony? Because yeah. the whole concept of this is to try and get them to understand that the completion of your faith is by accepting Muhammad which is a testimony. Okay, so it's a testimony. Oh. I have, I have Islam understood. That's okay, how does a testimony work then? That because you're concealing the knowledge of the Prophet yeah. coming from the desert tribes, yeah. you're, you're basically not, you're not attesting to the faith. Okay, so you're not attesting to the faith. But when do you give a testimony? When is a testimony wanted from you? Yes, yeah, sister? Yeah. 
Okay, so the Shahada goes against them. And that not really, I mean, the Mufassirin have not really mentioned that. When do we give Shahada? When do we give testimony? Because they'll be judged on what they say. They'll be judged on what they say. So because of that. So they don't have to say it then. They'll be judged on what they say. They don't have to say it. Witnessing, when something says Shahada, you have to say it. Like if the judge calls you and asks you to make a witness, you know, I don't want Okay, you can't stand back. You have to give a witness. Okay, you have to give testimony. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that this information that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is going to appear, or this information that Ibrahim alayhi salam and his, and his offspring were not a Jews, but they were on the faith of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Hanifiya. And or the third, which was that you trying to hide your evidence, which you don't really have any evidence, but you're trying to hide it. This is like the given the status of a testimony. That it was your responsibility that when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu appeared, that you go around telling people that he is the messenger. And it's your responsibility to be those bearers of the flag, to go around telling people that Islam is true. It was your responsibility. You are the witnesses. And if you don't carry this out, then this is a very, very grave crime. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ كَتَمَ شَهَادَةً عِنْدَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ Who is more of a zalim? Azlam, okay, is what the Arabs call ismu tafdil. Okay, when we say the most, the most, azlam. So here, zulam in the Arabic language means Placing something in its wrong place. And them not giving witness is placing something in its wrong place. And this is why when zulum increases in a society, what happens is that that society itself, naturally it, it, it will destroy itself. Whenever oppression, whenever unjust injustice, whenever unjust people go around, in societies, what happens is that society will destroy itself. And this is why whenever you see a Zalim ruler, his rule may be for a decade, two, three decades, for a while, but it will come to an end. And whenever you see an ideology which is full of oppression, you will see that after a while, the ideology will disappear. Because this is the natural way of Zulm. Zulm cannot exist forever in a society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith that that uh, da'wat al mazlum fear the prayer and the call of someone who's oppressed because between him and Allah there's no veil at all now the hadith doesn't mention a Muslim or a Kafir any person who is oppressed someone oppresses someone and from their heart that person calls out to Allah. There is no veil between them and Allah. Allah will directly answer that call. And this is why the Muhaddithin say, Allah answers the call of even a kafir, even a non-Muslim who is oppressed. A non-Muslim person being oppressed, Allah will answer his call. And this is why it's important that, you know, sometimes some people when they start practicing, they have this stereotype where we only have to be good to Muslims. You know, kafirs, you don't have to be good to kafirs. You can con them, you can cheat with them, you can do ghibat of them, you can rip them off, you can speak ill to them, you can do all these bad things to them. Why? Because they're not Muslims at the end of the day. Okay, but this is wrong. Because if you harm someone, if you do zulm to someone in any way, verbally, physically, in any way at all, and that person was just to make a dua against you, or just in his heart to have something against you, Allah Ta'ala will punish you for that. So it's important, may Allah save us from dhulm. All types of dhulm. The biggest dhulm is shirk. Because what a person is doing, he's being un unjust to Allah. He is giving the characteristics, the qualities of Allah to someone else. And this is the biggest dhulm someone can make. Inna shirk ala dhulmun azim. And then under shirk, there's many other dhulms that come. May Allah save us from all that. So woman azlamu. Allah says, who is the biggest dhalim? The biggest zalim, who is the biggest zalim? Mimman katama shahadatan. 
than the one who conceals a shahada, a witnessing. So he conceals witness, he conceals the truth. In the min Allah, with him from Allah, meaning shahada min Allah in the Okay, the witnessing of an information which has come from Allah with himself. So he conceals it. And this is why this is an indication towards the rabbis of Bani Israel. What the rabbis of Bani Israel used to do was that when they would teach their book, they would distort many of the meanings, several ways. One of the ways was that they would change it. Literally, they would change it. They would write something else. And then they would say, this is from Allah. Okay, they would write it and they say, هَذِهِ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ That's one way. Another way they would do it is that they would interpret it in a different way. They would say, okay, well, I mean, this piece of information is mentioned in our Torah, but it means this. So they would take it out of context. And this, if you read, there's a book by uh, Shahak Ishaq. Okay, Dr. Shahak Ishaq. And it's about the history of the Jews. He's a Jew himself. And he had an experience when he, were, when he went to Israel. He had an experience with the Jewish community and he was very disturbed by the experience. And so he wrote this book. And in the book he's mentioned how the rabbis, they take things out of context. For themselves, there's one scale and for others, there's another scale. Okay, so it's a very interesting book that you can get on PDF. Okay, written by Shahak is. Shahak, his, his name is Shahak Ishaq or Shahak Israel. I can't remember the full name. Now, woman um, Azlam, who is more of a zalim than the one who conceals? Why does Allah Ta'ala say who is more of a zalim than the one who conceals a witnessing? Isn't a witnessing okay? It's very d- bad, I mean, it's a big crime, but is it the biggest zulm that a person can ever do? Is concealing a witness or, or testimony? Is it the biggest crime a person can do? Why does Allah say it's the biggest dhulm? The greatest dhulm? Is it because of oppression? It means in terms of that knowledge and knowledge to get to your creator. And if you're distorting the source, you're distorting your akhirah. Okay, you're distorting. You're almost there. That's a, that's a hint that is. It's a clue. Yes, sister? Okay, the sisters mentioned it. Any other brother got the answer? They will ultimately lead up to shirk. Ultimately lead up to shirk. Possibly. There is a possibility there, but not. When is a crime... When does the severity of a crime increase? No, not really. When does a, you know, like a judge in court, when does he measure a crime or when does he consider to be a crime very very serious when what does he measure it with the amount of people that's affected the amount of people that is affected isn't it so here this kind of hiding this kind of piece of information it's not going to affect two or three people is it it's going to affect a whole nation of people in fact it can even affect the whole of mankind all right this is why sometimes when these pieces of information, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in, in the previous books. It's upon those people to make test, to be testimony to that. Okay, to make testimony of that. Not to hide the information, but to tell the people about this. And this is similar in Islam as well. In Islam, it is important for us to tell people about Islam. Not to hide Islam. Okay, sometimes a person is embarrassed to t- tell other people that he's a Muslim or she's a Muslim. Sometimes people are too embarrassed to tell other people about Islam. We believe in angels. Oh, they might laugh at us. We believe in angels. We believe in jinns. They might laugh at us. We believe in one Allah, our creator. They might laugh at us because it goes against science. But when it comes to these inf- pieces of information, these are things that can change a person's life. If a person just tells a person about Islam, the true Islam, then he has conveyed his message. He tells it in a good way, he has conveyed his message. Okay, I mean one way a person can tell about Islam is by, you know, hook and crook. He can go and force people 
Okay, shove it down their throats. That is not the way. La ikraha fi din. You can't force someone to accept Islam. Nicely, you explain to him. Look, this is our Islam. This is what we believe in. You know, whether you people believe in it, whether you people make a mockery of it, that's something else. But this is my beliefs, and I am firm on these beliefs. And you'll see people will respect you for that. If you are true to people, people will respect you for that. So it's important that no one conceals any piece of information. And because the Jews concealed that piece of information, what happened? That even till today, the Jews are deprived of. And this is why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He mentions the Bani Israel, He mentions them in different categories. Okay, one of the categories of Bani Israel are those who were learned. Okay, those who were learned, their crime, when Allah mentions their crimes in the Quran, their crimes are more severe than the crimes of the general public. Why? Because it goes back to what the brother said, that it affects more people. Because when you're a community leader, when you're a father figure, when you're someone high in society, a crime that you do is going to affect more people in your society than the crime of a person if one of us does it. And if a, if, if a minister gets caught with, you know, uh, with money, okay, you know, dealings here and there, or with drugs or something, his crime would possibly be treated in a different way, more severely, than a normal layman. So similarly in Sharia, a person who is more knowledge, a person who has some information, some knowledge, then that person's crime will be treated differently and more severely than the layman. Now, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this uh, expression, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ Who is more of a dhalim? In several places. Okay, several places. So this is just to remind you, for your homework, this is your... I want you to find all the verses, the different verses, which have وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ Who is more of a dhalim? That's number one. Number two is, the different verses out there, how do we reconcile between those verses? There can only be one thing that is more dhulm, isn't it? There can only be one thing which is more oppression, more unjust, most unjust. So why is Allah Ta'ala sometimes saying that this is most unjust, this is most unjust, this is most unjust? Okay, so that's the second. So two things I want you to find. The verses in the Quran which ex uh, uh, express, have this expression, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ And secondly, how do we reconcile between these different Verses. Okay, now the last the, the last part of the verse. Allah is not ghafil. Allah is not unaware of what you do. Now the word ghafil is from the word ghafla. Ghafla literally in the Arabic language means a land where it which has no signs on it. So a piece of land, a person goes somewhere far, goes to a desert, goes to very far, you know, in in the middle of the uh, the countryside and comes to a place where there's no signs there's no way of him knowing where south is where north is no way of him knowing where there's a settlement no way of him knowing where water is nothing this land is called ghafla okay land of ghafal and the person who <coughs> is unaware person who has no uh, uh, you know no idea Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls that person a ghafil person Okay, so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah is not ghafil of what you people do. Don't think that Allah is ghafil of what you people do. Why does he finish the verse off like this? In the previous one, verse, the past verse, it's saying, you're concealing, but you can't conceal from Okay, me. so you're concealing. Previously said you're, you're, you're concealing. So therefore Allah ta'ala is not unaware. Okay, he's not unaware of what you people are doing. Yes, sister? Okay, so it's a warning as well. This is a warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this verse, why doesn't Allah ta'ala say, Allah is aware of what you do? Allahu alimun bima ta'amalun. Why not say that? Why say Allah is, n is not unaware of what you do? What's the difference, yeah? Is it that if Mahai conceal stuff from the people, you can't conceal from Allah? Okay, so you, you, you might be able to hide it from people, but you can't hide it from Allah, true? Anything else? What's the difference in the two expressions, yes, sister? 
the style of the Quran definitely but is it just because oh this word sounds nice here so let's have wa ma Allahu bi ghafil this is like two negatives going okay so the two negatives equals a positive <laughs> no it's true ma nafi ghafil it means unaware so not unaware means aware isn't it now what you have to understand here is that al kinaya to ablag min as sarih the Arabs say al kinaya something which is implicit is more clear or is more impacting than something which is explicit <coughs> do you understand okay for example if the father catches the son on the road with some guys smoking or doing something the father goes okay wait till you get home he could have said to him I'm gonna beat you or I'm gonna sort you out instead of saying that he said wait till you get home now that has much more of an impact than saying to him I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with you at home do you understand so Allah is implicitly saying to them look Allah is not unaware of what you people do and as soon as that they hear that then immediately they'll start thinking because they know that on the day of judgment who are they gonna return to they can deceive everyone in the world they can hide anything they want in the world they can have big arguments and big talks and spreading their their beliefs in the world but once they enter that grave once they put their foot into the grave and the dust is put over them then it's only between them and Allah <coughs> And Allah is not unaware of what they do. Okay, Allah is not unaware of what they do. And this is why it's important to always be aware of Allah. And you know, sometimes there's a verse in the Quran way which can summarize the whole of the purpose of life. You know, sometimes in the Quran there's a verse which can summarize the whole of the purpose of life. This is one of those verses. If a person was to act upon this verse, that person would be successful. If a person was to act upon this verse that Allah is not unaware of what you do, then all of his life is going to be conscious. When he wakes up in the morning, he's going to be thinking. When he goes to work, he'll be thinking. When he deals with his employers or employees, he'll be thinking. When he deals with his friends, he'll be thinking. When it comes to issues with Muslims and Kuffar, he'll be thinking. When it comes to food, he'll be thinking. When it comes to night time, he'll be thinking. When it comes to what he watches, he'll be thinking. When it comes to what he listens to, he'll be thinking. Why? Because the verse is repeated in his mind. Allah is not unaware of what you do. Allah is not unaware of what you do. Allah is not unaware of what you do. And a time will come on the day of judgment where everything that a person has done will be laid out in front of him. So this verse is a very powerful verse. Now if you look at this verse, this verse has stages in there. Okay, there's stages in this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has first of all mentioned their claim and refuted their claim. Refuted their claim in a rhetorical way. That, okay, do you say that Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and Asbat, all of these were Jews and Christians? Rhetorical question. Obviously they don't say that, so they'll go quiet. Then secondly he says to them, that are you more knowledge than Allah? This is another piece of evidence. Thirdly, he says to them, okay, whoever hides testimony, whoever conceals the testimony, this person is the biggest uh, unjust person, the biggest zalim out there. And then finally, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of what you do. Allah is not unaware of what you do. Now why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this pattern? Why are the evidences mentioned in this f f order of four? If we think about it, first of all, that it suffices, their claim is so weak, okay, it's so flawed, that for them just to ask them this question, that are you saying that Ibrahim and all these people, that they were Jews and Christians? That would suffice them. Such an answer is enough for them. If they still don't accept, then you say to them, okay, are you saying that you're more knowledge than Allah? Allah is the one that has revealed your book. He's the one that's revealed the books that came after you. He's the one that has revealed the Quran. Are you saying you're more knowledge than Allah? Obviously they can't say anything. 
So that will be a second evidence against them. And a third evidence against them, that if you're hiding something in your books, if you're hiding something, then you're the biggest volume out there. You're the biggest unjust person out there. And finally, if that doesn't suffice you, if you still don't take heed from the first evidence, if you still don't take heed from the second evidence, if you don't take heed from the third piece of evidence, then only Allah on the Day of Judgment will deal with you. Because Allah knows everything you're going to do. And Allah knows everything you are doing. And when it comes to the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with you. Okay, so this is the severity of different types of people. There are some people who it's enough for them just to say to them that are you making this claim? People will stop. And there's some of them who are slightly above them. And for them, you have to mention a bit more. And for some, a bit more. And for some, nothing. Even if you were to debate all your life with them, they would still not accept. The only thing that would make them accept was if you warn them of a severe punishment and say to them, that a day will come when you will have to answer to Allah. You can hide it in this dunya, but a day will come when you have to answer to Allah. And these are the ways evidences are presented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the evidence are not only for different types of people, but the evidence also are in different ways. Like we mentioned, the six ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents evidences in the Quran. Okay, if we look at these pieces of evidence, these pieces of evidence fit in those categories as well. Logical evidence, aqal, Okay, aqal, intellect, using common sense. Evidence which is logical. أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمْ أَمِ اللَّهِ Okay, using your logic. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمْ مِمَّنْ كَتَمَ شَحَادَةٍ عِنْدَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ Okay, and uh, evidence which is to do with tajraba and experience. The experience tells us that society considers the worst person, okay, the worst person in society, the severest punishment for a person is the one whose punishment is you know due to such acts like hiding or concealing information and finally the wamallahu bighafil amma ta'malun that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not ghafil of what you do and this also can come under you know logical it can also come under tajriba as well now that's the verse and the final verse now alhamdulillah we try to finish this as well tilka ummatun qad khalat laha ma kasabat وَلَكُمْ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Okay, those, or that, that is a nation which has passed. For it is that which it's earned, and for you is that which you've earned. And you will not be asked about that which they did. Now this verse came early on, didn't it? Okay, this verse was mentioned early on in verse number 134. Okay, verse number 134. And this verse itself, exactly the same words are repeated again. You look at verse 134 and verse 141, exactly the same words are repeated again. Tilka ummatun qad khalat, exactly the same words. Now, what does this verse mean? We explained the meaning of this verse previously. Okay, so I won't be going into the, the verse itself. I'll just explain a quick explanation. Which is that the nation, referring to Ibrahim salam, Ismail salam, Ishaq salam, Yaqub salam, all of his offspring, okay, is the nation, the Ummah. Th- that was an Ummah. That was an Ummah which passed. That is an Ummah which has passed, which has gone, which has done and dusted, left this world. Number one. Number two, for it is that which it's earned. Everything which it's done in its life, that nation, everything that it did for the pleasure of Allah, it's earned it. Its earnings are done and the accounts are closed. And for you is that which you earn. Okay, whatever you have earned, your accounts are also are closed. And you will not be asked. You won't be asked about what these people used to do. Okay, the last part of it. Now, why is Allah repeating this again? This is a question the Mufassirin have mentioned. Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not repeat a verse in the Qur'an without a, a purpose, without an aim. There was an aim over there, verse 134, and there's an aim over here. 
Okay, does anyone know? Yes, sister? Yeah. Okay, so so uh, for, for over there, which they said, "Lana amalna wa lakum amalakum." For us, is our deeds for the, for them is their deeds. Yeah. Anything else? Mm, yeah. Why is this what he said? Once again, this is this step. Okay, it relates to the previous verse of Ibrahim Ismail. But what I want to know is what is the aim of bringing this verse here, and what's the aim of bringing the verse previously? Yeah. Now is the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this Ummah. How do you understand that? And what's the difference between this here, using it here and using it over there? I don't know about that, but uh, I know that he is here and it is just saying that he has that he is the Ummah from the day he has left in it. And uh, now it's, it's the start of a new Ummah now. Okay, like, um, not really. I wouldn't really be understood from that, yeah. Even though the Ummahs have changed, the message is still the same. Is it okay, just it. repeating it, just to make them more aware that? Um, not message? really. There's several answers the Mufassin have given. Several answers Mufassin have given. Okay, one of the answers the Mufassin have given is that this is the way the Arabs, they would speak. And this is something that you can experience in a talk. When a person is giving a talk, he repeats sometimes certain statements. In the beginning of the talk, he'll repeat it in the middle of the talk, he'll repeat it at the end of the talk. To emphasize a point, to emphasize a point, to emphasize a point. Because sometimes what happens is when a talk becomes long, people begin tend to forget what was mentioned earlier. And to bring them all back to the main issue. Okay, the issue is reiterated, is repeated again. That's the first opinion that's mentioned. The second that is mentioned is that this is referring to the verse 134 is referring to uh, the Jews with regards to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail, Ishaq alayhi salam. Okay, meaning that for them what they earned was what they earned. Okay, and for you is what you're going to earn. Okay, you're not going to be asked about what they did. And over here it's referring to the predecessors. Okay, the Salaf. Meaning that you can't rely upon what your Salaf did. You can't rely upon what your Salaf did. Whether it's Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail or whoever it is, you can't rely upon them. Okay, because they have gone. Now you are responsible for your own actions. Okay, they've done their job. Their duty is done. So you can't make them responsible for what you do. That's second. Number three is that over there it was referring to the issue of... Um, the claim that was made over there. The claim that was made over there was the people said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them that were you witnesses when Yaqub alayhi salam was at his deathbed? And when he said to his children that who will you worship after me? Will you? And they said that we will worship your Lord, the Lord of Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Ilahun Wahida, wa nahun lahu muslimun. Okay, so this verse, the, well, verse 134 is referring to the, that statement over there. Okay, that they had made their, their beliefs clear. They had made their beliefs clear and it's up to you to make your beliefs clear. And over here, it's referring to the statement which is, or the verses which are mentioned over here. That, do you say that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, Ishaq alayhi salam, that all of these uh, prophets are Jews and Christians? Okay, so if you're saying that, then this is what you say, this is what you've earned. And whatever they did is what they earned. You're not going to be asked about what they did. And similarly, some of us have even mentioned that this verse refers to the fact of Shafa'ah. Previously, it's mentioned of Shafa'ah. That you can't rely upon them to save you on the Day of Judgment. You do whatever you want in this world. You make up your own beliefs in this world. 
and then on the day of judgment you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you say and then you ask Ibrahim alayhi salam to, to intercede on your behalf because you messed up because you made up all these things about them okay you can't do that and in verse 141 it's referring to the fact that you can't on the day of judgment you can't present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the excuse that oh I thought these were Jews as well I thought Ibrahim alayhi salam was a Jew and he used to do what we do. Or I thought Ismail alayhi salam was a Jew and he used to do what we do. Or I thought his, all of his offspring. You can't use that. For them is what they did, for you is what you did. You're not going to be asked about what they used to do. Do you understand that? You understand that, yeah? Okay, so alhamdulillah, we finished this verse. Okay, and we finished the first Jews of the Quran. So one down, 29 to go. Okay, and one, alhamdulillah, we've done it in just less than two years. Okay, so don't know how long the rest of it is going to take. Inshallah, it'll take less, less time.